Well, shalom and welcome to this week's Living Torah. Uh, before we get into the scriptures of Yitro or Jethro, uh, a couple of, of announcements. Number one is Bezrat Hashem, God willing, with his help next month in, uh, let's see, what is it, March? Yeah, March 11th. Uh, I will be at Beit Menorah in the big city of Winchester, Kentucky. Uh, looking forward to being up there with some folks uh, that I've known for a long time, meeting some new people. Uh, I'll actually be speaking at two different congregations. I think the other one is Beit Or, but uh, I'm not exactly sure of that. I have not gotten the information on that yet. So uh, if you're anywhere in the Winchester, Kentucky area, I'd uh, love to see you come by there. So information, uh, you can go to uh, Beit Menorah website, Beit Menorah, Winchester, Kentucky, I think it is. I'll try to put that on my itinerary. I haven't really kept up with my itinerary page much because uh, I haven't been doing a lot of travel, but it looks like I might need to be doing that again. So the other thing is, if you are not listening to Life on Purpose, I just, I, I've got to brag on the guys, uh, uh, Ryan Cribbs, David Covert, of course, my son Daniel Clayton. Uh, we recorded last night, and Life on Purpose is a podcast that's also available on our YouTube channel or a Vimeo, Vimeo channel. A uh, number of other places you can get this, either on uh, audio or video. Uh, go to join to Hashem, joined to Hashem.org, and uh, all the links are there to get this. But uh, uh, you know, if, if I, and this is not because I'm on the program, but uh, this is designed for, focused toward young adults, um, you know, age 19 to 35 area. But with that being said, uh, youth, yeah, it's, it's it, it, I think youth can get a lot out of this. Uh, we have people from really uh, the whole spectrum of age groups that are watching this or watching listening to this program uh, if I was today raising a teenager I uh, had a young adult in my home that uh, you know under under the covering which means I'm buying their groceries um, if I didn't and uh, thankfully I don't right now but uh, if I did uh, I would require them there would be one program I would, I would require them to watch or listen to every week and write a report on that program, and that is Life on Purpose. Uh, these guys, uh, Ryan, David, Daniel, um, I, I'm, just, I, I'm just honored beyond mention to be able to work with these young men. The insights that they're bringing out, we now have 21 episodes online, and of course this is uh, now going over into a new broadcast on Hebrew Roots Network, which will be coming out, uh, I believe, the end of April, uh, called Life on Purpose, once again. And uh, the first ones are going to be with just Daniel and myself, but uh, that's going to be expanded, we're believing, uh, in, in, in coming days. So um, I, I just really challenge you that if you, uh, if you, you know, listen to it, watch it, uh, but also if you have influence over young people and if you uh, well I, I, yeah I'm gonna go ahead and say that if you don't have influence over young people you need to figure out why you don't uh, if we're not influencing a rising generation each one of us in some way go out and find pray that the father will bring you someone and then learn how to relate uh, I I personally believe this is going against the, our, our, our total society today, but I really believe that young people are looking for those who uh, can communicate with them. And that may, that may, may be making some changes in your own life, may mean you're going to have to, uh, you know, to do some things to, to be able to relate to them, not be one of them, but, but be an adult. You know, well, you know, the, the masses are not... Lit. No, find one young person. Uh, this happened to me when I first uh, came to Messiah back in 1986. Many of you know the, the story of uh, a man right over here, my, my right shoulder, John Faust, who he literally singled me out in that church in, in, uh, that we were going to in Tucson, Arizona, 
He literally singled me out. At 28 years old, he was 84, and he began to pray for me, and he began to relate to me, and um, I'm thankful for that man. Maybe there's young people that are needing a person like John in their lives, and maybe you're that person. So uh, all that being said, just to say, um, you know, we, we would appreciate your help in getting this podcast, this, uh, this YouTube out to more people. We're doing some other things in the, uh, trying to do some other things in the coming weeks in order to, uh, to, to make this more available on some other social media sites, uh, things that we're I am getting some help to, to do that. Okay, uh, with that being said, let's go to the Torah portion of Etro, and uh, this starts in Exodus, Shemot, chapter 18, and it says in verse 1 that Etro, Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moshe's father-in-law heard all that Elohim had done for Moshe and for Israel, his people, and how Yahweh had brought Israel out of Egypt. Goes on from there that Etro takes this opportunity to bring Sipporah and his two sons to him. But uh, that is, I mean, that's part of the process here of the restoration of the family. Why is it that Zipporah, the, the two sons, uh, did not join Moshe in, uh, in Egypt? Well, uh, it is speculation, of course, but I would like to say that there are times in which, in our lives, we're going to have to have um, a, 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 I don't want to use the word distractions taken away, but Moshe had to focus for a time only on the job. You know, there's a reason why when someone goes to battle, the family doesn't go with them. Why? Because they're probably going to die. They're going to lose their focus. Moshe had to focus in this time, but now that time, that season is over, and they are going to be reunited in the process Yet Jethro, Yitro, is going to become an integral part in the council of Moshe's life. Now, uh, to the best of my study, uh, Midian is a society. Uh, Yitro, of course, is a high priest, but they believed in many gods. So the whole encounter, and, and though they did not have email and, you know, and, and Fox News and CNN and all those kind of things, the... The accounts of things that were happening that day, news was still traveling, and it was a, a very small world. It wasn't that far from Midian, from where Moshe will be taking the people back to Mount Sinai, to Egypt. So the news of what has been going on in this past year, and the story of the splitting of the Reed Sea, this news is probably traveling pretty fast. Etro finds out that Moshe is in the midst of it, and all of a sudden he's like, wait a minute. Uh, I've, been, I've been serving many gods, but this one that Moshe had told me about while he was here in my home, I now believe that this is the one true greater God. Well, let's, uh, I, I guess we could look at the, uh, the verses here. In verse 10, Etro said, Blessed be Yudhevave, who has rescu rescued you from the Egyptians and from Pharaoh, who has rescued the people from the harsh hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that Yudhevave is greater than all other gods because he rescued those who were treated so arrogantly. Etro, Moshe's father-in-law, brought a burnt offering, sacrifices to Elohim, and Aaron came with all the leaders of Israel to share the meal before Elohim with Moshe's father-in-law. We could call this a conversion experience for Etro. We could call this, I believe, a born-again experience. 
in which he is departing from his, <clears throat> his teachings of many gods and is now following the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <clears throat> the monoistic, monoistic, yeah, monoistic, I guess that's the word. As I'm talking into my coffee cup there. The monotheistic God, that there is only one true God. And I think he's saying, and he is greater than any of the other, what I have thought were gods in my life. Now, that faith produces obedience, for he brings a sacrifice, which is not something that he is unfamiliar with. His life has been about bringing sacrifices, but it's been about bringing sacrifices to false gods, and now he is bringing a sacrifice to the true God. The next verses <clears throat> is that Jethro now is placed in a position in Moshe's life because of his own, Jethro's own <clears throat> conversion. He is now placed in a position as an elder, as a person of counsel in Moshe's life. Jethro looks at what Moshe is doing. He is literally killing himself. He's wearing himself out with every single problem. And let's face it, these people had no shortage of problems. Uh, from grumbling and complaining, it just kind of moved on from there. So everything that is going wrong in the camp, every negative aspect of the camp is being laid at the feet of Moses. Um, <clears throat> I have known pastors through the years who have taken it upon themselves to be the counselor for everyone. Uh, I have never seen that work out real well because the person that takes every single burden upon themselves, no matter how great, no matter how small, will in the end burn out their life looking back from experience at people who have done this their lives are a disaster you can only take so much negative in your life uh i guess we could do a little trail here i won't do a rabbit trail because you know you shouldn't chase something that's not kosher but we could do a little trail here considering the conspiracies of the day. How many people are so focused on every single conspiracy that they have no life? The conspiracies are literally sucking the lives out of them. Okay, back on course here. So he says... Uh, Jethro comes to Moshe and gives him some really good counsel. And Moshe has the wisdom to understand that this is counsel that's not just coming from Etro, his father-in-law. This is coming from yud heh vav -Hey, his father. And so he accepts it, puts it into his life. And this takes Moshe to another level of leading the people. Now, again, I want to take off just a little ways from this and ask a couple of questions, or at least one question, and that is this. With each of us, we need to ask ourselves the question, who are we taking counsel from? Now, I know people that uh, I have met people. I don't hang around them often because they don't really want to be around me and I don't want to be around them. And so it's a mutual agreement that we don't want to be around each other. Uh, I, I have known people that don't want to take counsel from anyone. Well, you know, I think that the scripture is still in the scripture that says in the multitudes, multitude of counselors, there is safety. And so this attitude 
that well, just you know, just me and God. I'll just I'll just go to God and I'll just get everything from Him. And uh, you know, that doesn't normally work out real well in the end, because the Father has designed the system of this earth to put us in a place that we need each other and then can relate to one another and help each other in our walk. Mm, yeah. Uh, so we need to ask ourselves, once again, who are we taking counsel from? Um, I have kind of a, a rule here that I go by. And if I am going to, uh, I mean, taking counsel from, this this doesn't necessarily mean, you know, somebody you're going to their office or, or whatever. Uh, it can be a teaching online. It can be, you know, a, a book you're reading or something like this. But if I'm, if I'm taking counsel from someone, using their life to enrich my life, and therefore bringing me closer to the Father, there's a couple of things that I want to know. Number one, is this a person who believes in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Is this a person who has a relationship with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? And has that relationship then brought forth a life of obedience? So if, if you're taking counsel from someone who does not, who is an atheist, who is, and I said to uh, someone I was talking to the other, the other day, yesterday actually, uh, we were talking about uh, atheists and, and the person said, you know, I've never really, I don't think I've ever truly met an atheist. And I said, well, <laughs> you know, atheism only lasts a lifetime anyway, but uh, moving on. So if, if I'm taking uh, counsel from someone who is an atheist, agnostic, uh, who just believes that all flights get to Chicago. Oh, or, or, or you know, all, yeah, tricked you there. Uh, all paths lead to heaven. All paths lead to God. And it doesn't really matter which path you're on. Try that at the airport. Try that next time you're driving from one place to another. It doesn't matter what exit we get off on. It doesn't matter what road we're going to take. We're all going to get to the same place. That would be stupid. Yeah. That would be stupid in the natural and is equally stupid in the spiritual, folks. There is only one path. There is only one direction, and it is revealed to us in this book by the one that Jethro said he is greater than all other gods. <coughs> he is the one true God. All right. So look at who. Ask yourself a question. This is important in the day that we live in. Ask yourself the question, who am I taking counsel from? If their life is a mess, you probably shouldn't take counsel for, from them. What do you think? Okay. Now, moving on. Yes, I will. Moving on to uh, where am I at? Uh, Moshe, in verse 24, Moshe paid attention. And because of that, he was able to lead the people in a much greater way than he could originally, than the, his design originally. So it is one thing to seek out counsel, <clears throat> godly counsel. It is quite another to take that counsel and put it into our lives. So if someone speaks truth into your life and you know it's truth, you now have a choice whether to walk in that truth or not. Now, seeking counsel and taking counsel is sometimes going to mean that you're going to be offended a little bit along the way, that it's going to, uh, it, it may kind of rub you the wrong way at times, but if you're seeking out godly counsel, then that person is going to have your best interest at heart. 
uh, the person over my other shoulder right here is my grandmother. And uh, Granny had no problem in, uh, in giving me her counsel. And I'm very thankful for that. You know, she had no problem in telling me, don't chew with your mouth open. Uh, don't talk with your mouth open. Don't slouch. Stand up straight. She just had no problem at all in telling me these things. And today, I'm thankful for that. Because I knew that there was never a moment in time that her words did not have my best interest at heart. Seek godly counsel. And then seek to walk in godly counsel. Um, I'm going to go all the way over to chapter 19. Uh, the, the word here, they set up camp in the desert. There in front of the mountain, Israel set up camp. Uh, this is, uh, there's a plural and a singular here that when they went into the wilderness, into the desert, they set up camps, plural, and then it says there in front of the mountain, they set up a singular camp. They began to understand that he has an order in all things. When they went into the wilderness, it wasn't, well, you know, I kind of like camping over there. It's, uh, you go to a campsite, uh, <clears throat> and you, in many Sukkots that I know of, that, I, that I've gone to in the past, it's not just you kind of go in and, and go anywhere you want, but you're assigned a campsite. If you have a tent, you're assigned a campsite in the tent section. If you have a, a, a small trailer, a pop-up or something, you're assigned a campsite in the small trailer section. If you have one of these giant rolling sukkahs, you're assigned a campsite in the giant rolling sukkah section. Why is this? Because the, what is there is what is suited to you. If you are camping in a tent, you don't need the 50 amp outlet. So for you to camp over there where the 50 amp outlet is would be a waste of the resources of that campsite. If you have the big rolling sukkah and you're camping over in the tent section, first of all, you may run over something getting through, the, trying to park that silly thing, but then you don't have the resources. So the father knows as we walk through this, what resources we need and where we should be setting up our camp. Okay, you can think about that one on your own. Now, in uh, verse 5 of this same chapter, <clears throat> it says, and I'm, I'm really skipping over quite a bit here, Now if you will pay attention to what I say and keep my covenant, then you will be my own treasure from among the people. The counsel, back to this, the counsel that we receive from those that we're seeking counsel from, in the end, need, must, not need, must line up with the counsel of the Almighty. So, if I don't know this book, and I go out and seek counsel from someone that is not living by this book, then what I hear from them may sound good to my flesh, but may be detrimental to my spirit. So the counsel of Etro, Jethro, had to line up with the counsel that Moshe he, he saw the mirror image in, he, he saw, he literally was hearing the words that he had heard all the way back to the burning bush. But now instead of the burning bush there in front of him, he was hearing those same words through Jethro. Do we, do not discount the words of other people in our lives. Well, I just, you know, I just want to go hear from God. 
Well, maybe, and I've seen this many, many times, maybe the voice of God is coming through one of your children. Kathy reminded me of this the other day. We didn't, uh, we actually didn't get to tell the story to some folks, but uh, years ago, we were in Tucson, Arizona. We had absolutely no money at all, and uh, but we had two cars. I had a, I had a Jeep uh, that I, we had bought in Alaska when, you know, before the economy crashed up there, and then we had a, a, a baby blue diesel rabbit. Now, anybody that knows, <laughs> you know, those, it was, it was quite a car in the day. Uh, it came with rattles, but it would last literally, it seemed like forever. And so we had this, uh, this Jeep Cherokee, very nice. And then we had this diesel rabbit. Well, we didn't need two cars. We really didn't need two car payments. And so we decided that, okay, we're going to sell one of those cars. Well, in our mind, of course, it is, we need to sell the car with the highest car payment. So we put a sign on the, on the Jeep and uh, Kathy's uh, driving it one day and uh, the, the sign, I, I put the sign on with tape and the sign had fallen down inside. And so she told me, I went back and I put it back on and uh, it fell off. Well, our daughter, Crystal, is, uh, is a little thing at that time. And uh, she, Kathy said, oh, the sign fell off again. And right out of the blue, Crystal, from her little car seat, says, Mommy, that's because you're trying to sell the wrong car. Well, Kathy told me that, and I said, okay. So I took the sign, I uh, changed a little bit on it, put it on the other car, and the next day it sold for full price. Don't discount, especially the little, the little voices in your life. They may be the one. See, those little voices, those are not as, as polluted <laughs> by the things of this world. And so when a child says something to me, uh, I'm more apt to listen than when an adult says something to me. That was kind of a cool memory for me. Um, it says that you will be my own treasure. Uh, some translations say a peculiar people. Some say a special treasure. The word is samek gimel lamed hey. Uh, which is a, a kind of a fascinating word. It's only used very few times and is from an, un, it says from an unknown root word or an unused root word. So let's just look at it this. Samek gimel lamet hey. The samek is a letter of a surrounding. Something is surrounding you. Okay, the gimel is a man who is walking. If we look at that letter, it literally looks like a man with two feet that is walking. Uh, the lamet is, of course, the letter of the king. It is the shepherd's staff, and the hay is the breath and authority. So what is this, this word kind of meaning to us? I, I may be a little bit out on the edge of this. Brad Scott might, uh, might correct me, uh, might would have corrected me a little bit. I think he'd be okay with it. So this is about our walk. And as we're walking with his staff and breath of authority that we're relying upon. So we're relying upon his counsel in our lives, his authority in our walk, his breath in our walk. What is he going to do? He is going to put a surrounding a hedge, to, to quote from the book of Job, a hedge of protection around us. So let, let's take it two different places. Number one, uh, go back to the, the old days of Star Wars or, or some of these things. You know, the force field. There was, there was a force field around the USS Enterprise. And of course, it was always going down. But uh, if it hadn't, of, that wouldn't have made much of a show. Another, that's another subject that probably was a rabbit trail. Um, so this force field, he actually is placing this, this hedge of protection around us. The other one I'm getting is, if you've ever watched uh, you know, being uh, in, in air traffic control, work at, I, I worked uh, tower a lot, but I got to be around the radars a little bit. 
And so what did you have? You had this, this, little, this little ID thing that went along. You've got, a, you've got a, uh, an aircraft, a picture of it, and then you've got this little ID, and you watch it as it goes across the scope. So it's, and you can literally, uh, with the computer, you can actually highlight this thing and uh, so that you're, it's, it really draws your attention. And I, I, that's what I kind of see it as. It's like, a, you know, maybe a video game that there's this one, and I don't, I've never played, really never played me video games after, I think the last video game I played was Pong. But uh, it's, it's like this one character that's going through from one place to another, and there's this pointer upon him. And, and so the father is, is saying in the midst of this that as you walk through your life, I'm going to keep you highlighted so that if anything comes against you, I, it's like a warning, warning goes off and he's going to come and, and make sure that force field is around you. Okay, eh, maybe that's a, a crazy thought, but uh, hopefully you can get something out of that one. All right, then we turn the page and we have the 10 words. All right. Um, the foundation of the Torah. Now, this is this is where we get into uh, the the whole concept. You talk to people and they say, "Well, you know, the Torah is done away with." Well, well, what about the Ten Commandments? Oh, no, 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 no. The Ten Commandments are still intact. Well, what about number uh, number four commandment regarding the Shabbat? Well, no, he's changed that one. Okay. Uh, you, you can't talk out both sides of your mouth on this one, but it doesn't. Not, it does not. In my experience, it does not bring forth anything of profitability to simply argue. So what you're doing is someone says the Torah is done away with, and you say no, it's not. They say, yes, it is. You say, no, it's not. They say, yes, it is. And as you continue this wonderful <clears throat> conversation, the volume of how you're saying it rises, and as the volume rises in a conversation, have you ever noticed walking, you know, listening to the talking heads occasionally, as the volume around the table rises, the hearing decreases. Anytime that you have to increase the volume for someone to hear, you're using the wrong approach. So why don't we back up and consider that maybe we could paint them a picture that would be more profitable in the conversation. So if you're, you know, around a person, you can do this. Um, you, you can literally just take a, you know, take your pen, take your paper, and um, I'll, I'll switch over to another piece of paper here. And um, if I can p turn the page. All right. So take a piece of paper. For those that are you know, listening on Hebrew Nation or something like this, you just have to imagine this. And draw a, or just make a dot in the center. And my drawing is terrible. I draw flies. Uh, about as good as anything, but just put a dot right there in the center and say, let me, let me ask you a question. Do you want God's will in your life? Well, if you're in a conversation with someone, it's about this. It's probable that their answer is going to go, well, yes, of course I do. Okay. Well, let me, let me draw out something about God's will in our life, which is by the way, uh, you know, if we look at the word sin, it means missing the mark. And to live righteously means to hit the mark. So there's our mark in life. Uh, how, could we, how, how could we maybe uh, explain this? If someone was to ask us in our lives, uh, you know, what is the, the greatest commandments regarding uh, our, our life upon this earth, and how to please God. Well, they would probably say, you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Got it. Hey, there's the bullseye. A plus. You win. But 
Let me ask you the second question. How do we do that? What do you mean? No, how do I love God with all my heart, soul, and strength? How do I love my neighbor as myself? Is, is it just a random thing? Do we just kind of pull things out of, out of the sky or, you know, uh, open up a fortune cookie, which I don't think we should be doing. Uh, maybe you could, no, you shouldn't be looking at the horoscope. Uh, how do I do this? Well, he's given us a way to do that, and that is if we're wanting to hit the mark, okay, then the first ring around the mark, which is the mark is God's will for our lives, the first will, the first ring around it is the two commands. Okay, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. But I don't really know how to do that. So what do you do? Let's draw another ring. Okay, I told you I'd draw terrible. Uh, and this is the ten words. So in the ten words, got that? In the ten words are. <clears throat> I am Yudhe Vavhe, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the abode of slavery. You're to have no gods before me. You're not to use my name in vain. You're to honor my Shabbat. Okay? So that is the essence of how we are to love him with our heart, soul, and strength. Then, uh, honor your father and mother. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false evidence or a lie. Uh, do not covet your neighbor's house or his donkey or his wife or anything else. So this is about how do we um, how do we honor how do we love each other, our neighbor as ourself. Those are in those six commandments. So we have four, and then the the fifth the um, uh, we have the, you know, one, two, three, four. Uh, we have Shabbat is kind of this, this pulling together of the two. And then we have honor your father, your uh, murder, adultery, stealing, you know, th these, these last ones. So part of them are about the spiritual realm in loving him. Part of them are about the natural realm, about showing love and respect to each other. But how do I do that? So I don't know how to love him. Okay, I don't know how to honor him. I, I don't, I, there's, you know, how do I uh, have, not have other gods before him? Uh, you know, how do I honor my father and my mother? Uh, especially if for a number of people out there, maybe your parents or maybe one of your parents was not very honorable. So does that just, you know, mean that, I, I don't have to do that? Or are there ways that I can honor a parent that wasn't honorable? Just because they gave us life, we should, it should be reason enough for us to honor them in some way. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to go any farther than that. Um, and, and, you know, then what does it really mean to, to, to murder? Okay, if we go to... Uh, um, uh, referencing Matthew chapter 5 in this one, uh, referencing Matthew uh, 7 or 19, a uh, number of references that Yeshua talked about uh, that he, it seems that he took the bar to another level. No, the, the bar was always there, by the way. And we can look at this in Matthew chapter 5 specifically as Yeshua was looking at a people who were saying, we can come up with righteousness of our own. We have figured out a way to, to sow the fig leaves once again. And so Yeshua was saying, if that's your standard, if, if self-righteousness, you working out your own redemption uh, by your own deeds... Let me show you the level that you have to go to. That it's not just that you haven't pulled the trigger. It's that you've thought about pulling the trigger. It's not that you haven't uh, been in the act of adultery. Have you thought about the act? That, that's the level of righteousness we must come to 
if we're going to come to him in our own self-righteousness. But by his grace, he has brought us in. The gospel is about, part of the gospel is about his, about our redemption. He has covered us with and, and given us the way to repent and to return to him by leaning upon his righteousness and not our own. Okay, back on subject here. So, how do I do these things? <clears throat> how do I uphold the ten words? Well, let's draw another. Oh, it gets even worse here. Okay. Uh, let's draw another circle around this. And let's put in the, the number 603. Okay, 613 commandments believed in the, uh, in the Tanakh. But let's, we have 10 already. So what's the 603 about? The 603 are about us being able to, it's, a, it's, it's how to do the 10, which is how to do the 2, which is how to do the bullseye. And around that, what do we have? We have the, the writings. That looks, this looks terrible on camera, so I'm not going to do any more. We have the, the prophets. We have the writings. Uh, I'll give you an example. It says, honor the Shabbat. Okay? Uh, you are not to do any work for in six days. Um, you're not do you, your son, your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock. Uh, so where do we see uh, where do we see something in the prophets and the writings? Well, we go over to the book of of uh, Nehemiah, and in Nehemiah they actually were were doing everything they could to buy and sell on Shabbat, to the point that they literally started to lock the gates so that nobody could do merchant, so nobody could, could buy and sell. And, and that same thing is true today. I mean, I, I, it, it's amazing to me. I don't have a problem uh, with, you know, I, there, there's nothing at Walmart that I need on Shabbat that I couldn't have gotten on Friday. And if I didn't get it on Friday, I don't need it on Shabbat. Okay, I should have prepared better. It should be a, a lesson in better preparation. Um, are there people today that have to work on Shabbat? Yeah, there are. And I'm not judging. I don't condemn. But what I do, do tell people is, well, maybe this is your life now. But have you thought about praying that the Father would release you? Well, that could never work. Oh, really? Is he not more powerful than the other gods, Jethro? <laughs> is he or isn't he? I've seen instance after instance after instance when someone said, I know that right now I'm having to work on Shabbat, but I'm going to start praying. And I cannot tell you the, different, the number of times that I've seen all of a sudden, in fact, it's been a few times that all of a sudden the, uh, their boss or whatever just came to them and said, you know, uh, we just don't need you here on Saturday anymore or on Friday night anymore. It's like, okay, well, that's what you're praying for. It, it is, is, is he not bigger than the schedule that a human being is putting out? Come on, guys. But if you just desire... To break it. I mean, it's, why would he intervene in that? So, the, the prophets, the writings. Then we have the, the Gospels. Now, I can't find a new commandment in the Gospels. It's not there. In fact, you know, it's said, and I, I think I might still have this on my website, I'm not sure, a list of the, uh, the 613 commandments in the Torah but also in the Renewed Covenant, there's about 1,050. Wow. So if somebody's getting up tight about the 613, which, by the way, there's only a little over 200 that any of us can do 
because some of those commandments can only be done when there's a standing temple, and since there's not, we can't. Some of them can only be done if you're a guy. Some of them can only be done if you're a, not a guy. Okay? Some for men, some for women. And he's not confused about where, who you are. He created you, and he's not confused about what you are. Okay? Um, yeah. Craziness of our day. So, there are commandments that are only for the Levites. Uh, you know, the Levites have to have a temple, so if you can be a Levite, but still not be able to c complete those commandments because there's no temple for you to com complete man. So there's about 250, I think somewhere around there, that we can actually do. The ones in the Renewed Covenant, to the right of, you know, from the right of Mal Malachi, uh, things like do not fear. Ugh. Yeah, that's a commandment. Do not worry. That's a commandment. I uh, can go on and on, read through the the words, and mark down every time he says to you, you know, do not worry, do not fear, trust him. It, it's it's pretty amazing. In every single one of those commandments that is in the renewed covenant, by the way is in the 613 is in the t and goes back to the 10 which goes back to the 2 which goes back to the 1 which is the will of Hashem in our of God of, in our lives so maybe if you sat down with somebody instead of an argument over it's done away back and forth which is never going to work out and you sat down and drew them even, I mean, if they, if you draw, draw like I do, it's going to be laughter while you're doing it. So that maybe that'll help too. But maybe showing them the bullseye and saying, and by the way, uh, did you know that the word sin means to miss the mark and that we are called to live a life of righteousness, which is hitting the mark and the father has not given us a, he has not given us a blindfold. He has given us full sight, which is called this word, and shows us how to hit that. Now, one last thing uh, before we end up is that Moshe is then called to the top of the mountain. It says, um, uh, Moshe answered the people, don't be afraid uh, because Elohim has come only to test you and make you uh, fear him so that you won't commit sin. So the people stood at the distance, but Moshe approached the thick darkness where Elohim was. I know that this is spoken directly to uh, about Moshe, but understanding this, that there is a place of darkness, that in order to find the place of his light, you're probably going to have to go through a place of darkness. It's the same as in order to get to a hilltop, you have to go through a valley. It's just the way things are. So if you are in a dark place, embrace it. Embrace the darkness. Embrace his darkness. Maybe... You know, if we go back to uh, the, the first chapter of, of Bereshit, Genesis, did he not create the place of darkness? And then he shone the light in it and overcame the darkness? He may call you to something that you don't understand, to walk you through it, to find a place of light that you've never seen before. That's something to just kind of ponder on your own. So with that, Shabbat Shalom, Shavua Tov. Have a blessed, prosperous week. Bezrat Hashem, God willing, see you again next week. And um, Life on Purpose. Check it out. Share it. Um, give us some ideas. Give us your, your, your comments, your suggestions on the program. But uh, we could really use your help in getting this out to more people. Until next week, be strong. 
Yivarecha Chadonai V'yishmarecha Ya'er Adonai Panav Elecha V'yichunecha Yisa Adonai Sem lecha shalom.